my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you rejected knowledge. I also reject you for being priest for me. Hosea chapter four, verse six. In this video, we're going to go through some documents that are linked to gain some knowledge. And with that knowledge, you can do what you want, but hopefully with knowledge, we can have wisdom. I was in the ICC from 2008 to 2022, and I felt like I was putting together a puzzle piece in the dark. And hopefully with these articles and these links, the lights will turn on. You might be asking, why is there confusion? Well, confusion because Kip has adopted uh, the phrase from Winston Churchill, which is history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. And Kip has written his own history. And uh, what we're going to expose here is that it actually contradicts itself. Uh, if you want to know Kip's side of things and how he writes history, you can read Ron Harding's book, Modern Christianity, The Untold Story, as it was fully edited by Kip McKean, just like any soapy book. So let's jump in here in regards to why is this stuff not making sense when it comes to Kip McKean and what has happened? We're first going to go back in time uh, to a site called Sue Condon's Diary and the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, she writes this from her journey uh, being in the Boston movement from the 90s. Uh, she was from the Mainline Church of Christ. And I just want to scroll down to read you just a short uh, passage here. It says, there is a common denominator of everyone being raised up to leadership. He must not make waves, cause trouble, disagree, question why things are done. A person like this stands little chance of moving up unless he knows someone at the top immediately. This is learned quickly. People who make waves are referred to as struggling. If they see a problem and point it out, they don't trust in God or they have a bad heart that needs to be dealt with. Their criticism came from the overflow of their heart, which is bad. Keeping quiet occurs in all stages of leadership, right up to the evangelists. That's why I entitled this book, The Emperor's New Clothes. When I was in London, I couldn't believe that no one could really see what was going on. Then I realized that they did, but they didn't have the courage to admit it for fear of losing their position. And they were right. We definitely did lose our position when we spoke up. And I'm putting this out there as one of the first articles because it's it's dated back to the 90s. And it kind of gives you a good sense of someone else's perspective of being in the ICOC from the Boston movement and even traveling uh, to a different country and what that experience was. As we know, even in a, in a juror, uh, it's the testimony of more than one witness. And that's what I'm trying to help people to see here. Uh, also, the second one is a uh, article or um, uh, a postgraduate study uh, by Andy Fleming. And uh, he did his practical theology at the University of uh, Birmingham in the UK. And uh, he, of course, completed a review in 2010 on charismatic leadership. That's also about Kip. Uh, very interesting. I uh, read parts of that. And then 2018, he wrote this, let us each one be careful how he builds. And it really goes into the growth of the ICOC. And one of the things I want to show everybody here is just the, the lies that we were told in the ICC. Uh, here he has the years of the Boston movement, the ICOC membership additions and deletions pre-2003, so it, it ends in 2003. And what he's showing here is the additions and deletions and the end of year membership. And he shows that as it is growing, it's growing and growing and growing, but the additions start to taper off and uh, the deletions start to taper off where they finally meet each other here in 2002. But what he's showing here is the tipping point is actually in 1998. It is showing that there was been a downfall in the movement uh, under Kip's leadership and not after he uh, was put on sabbatical in 2001. I just thought that was very interesting. Of course, this next one is uh, going into Kip taking a sabbatical leave. And um, it says on the evening of Sunday 11th, November 2001, it was announced that Kip and Elena McKean are stepping down from leadership of the Los Angeles Church of Christ and the ICC altogether due to family and marriage issues. Of course, they put different leaders, Al, uh, Al Baird and, and Bob Gimple will lead the world sectors. And of course, when you click on this, it just takes you to a link that is no longer available. So I wanted to go in and get an excerpt 
uh, from Kit McKean on Wikipedia. I know it's not a trusted source, but there is a following statement that I'd like to read to you about the sabbatical. It's uh, Kip wrote this then on Monday, the 12th of November, 2001. Uh, he says, during these days, Elaine and I have been coming to grips with the need to address some serious shortcomings in our marriage and family. After much counsel with the Gimples and Bairds and the other world sector leaders, as well as hours of prayer, we have decided it is God's will for us to take a sabbatical and to delegate for a time our day-to-day -day ministry responsibilities so that we can focus on our marriage and family. And, and what a great... Um, decision to take care of your family. Um, and of course, Kip says it was God's will. I then want to fast forward in time to 2002 uh, to show you Kip's resignation letter. And uh, this really shows in 2002 where he was at and why he resigned. And that's important because later on, history is going to change according to Kip. Of course, he quotes Psalm 126. And then he says, truly, the Lord has blessed his modern day movement as his gospel has produced true churches of disciples in 170 nations over the past 23 years. However, this hour is personally a time of tears. God, through his word, through circumstances and through true brothers, has made it clear that my leadership in recent years has damaged both the kingdom and my family. My most significant sin is arrogance, thinking I am always right, not listening to the counsel of my brothers and not seeking discipling for my life, ministry, and family. I have not followed Jesus' example of humility and leadership. Other sins manifested themselves through my anger. My anger has often shut people down and, worse yet, fostered an environment where people were afraid to speak up. Additionally, I failed to build strong, mutual, helpful relationships. I did not respect those whose leadership gifts could have complemented my own. I was insensitive to the need of weaker Christians and churches. I also caused some to operate from wrong motives and others to stumble because I focused more on numeric goals than on pleasing God. To my shame, I allowed myself to be glorified more than calling everyone to give glory, all the glory uh, to God. Give God all the glory, excuse me. Since these are character sins, they surface in my family as well as in the church. Therefore, because I have so severely failed God in his movement, I have decided to resign from my role as world missions evangelist and leader of the world sector leaders. I would like to apologize to all Christians and all the churches for all the things I have done and have tempted some to drift from God. I take full responsibility for how my sins have spiritually weakened and embittered many of our churches. I also take full responsibility for the spiritual condition of my family. I pleaded to God to forgive my many sins, and I deeply desire your forgiveness as well. I am very, very sorry. I want to thank all my brothers and sisters in the kingdom for your support over the years. You have given so much of your lives and time to help build the kingdom and encourage my family. I am extremely grateful for the Bairds and Gimples who have counseled and, when necessary, rebuked Elena and me during the past year. I'm very appreciative of the leadership of the Los Angeles, San Francisco, Boston churches, as they have made many efforts to spiritually strengthen my family. Elaine and I are especially grateful for Steve and Lisa Johnson, Russ and Gail Ewell, Bruce and Robin Williams, Peter and Laura Garcia, and Sam and Gary Lang. They have been invaluable advisors in these difficult days. We also are grateful to God for the leaders of the South region of the Los Angeles church who have given us new and comforting spiritual home. Please pray for me that someday these tears, which are no longer shed in self-pity, but because I have hurt God and his people, will give birth to a joyous harvest of righteousness. A new governance is being discussed and formed by the world's sector leaders and other leading evangelists, elders, and teachers. I shall give them my full support as they strive to follow the scriptures and the principles of our heaven, uh, Father in heaven. And so that's what Kip wrote in 2002 when he resigned. And, and notice it was ownership for his own sin. And um, I think everybody was very excited for that and, and ready to forgive. However, if you fast forward, uh, here is an article written uh, by some incredible disciples uh, in 2006, and they discussed their time of 2002 to 2003. What's very interesting about this is this time period is when Kip took possession of the Portland Church of Christ. And the way that Kip has told us is different than what these disciples uh, claim. And I want to just scroll down here on this, this article here to read to you uh, just a little uh, insight to what was going on in the church. It says here, it was decided to send Kip to Portland. San Francisco was very concerned about the money in the bank in Portland. And San Francisco hired Kip. And after Kip took over the Portland church, Russ Yule seemed to pretty much let go of Portland. 
Uh, Russ Ewell was overseeing Portland at the time. Okay. After this decision was made, it was announced to the Portland church that Kip McKean was going to come to the Portland Church of Christ and see if he wanted leadership post of the church. And if he wanted the leadership post of the church. This was such a random shift for the Portland Church after the dramatics that had taken place in recent weeks. Many leaders and members of the Portland Church went to Kip and tried to persuade him that the leadership methods of the past were simply destructive and should not continue. It was futile. Kip refused to engage in reasoning together and responded with one trite answer after another. Kip said, of course, a mature disciple should always get behind their leaders no matter what. That was the final straw for many. Couple after couple went to Kip and confronted the same stubborn refusal to listen. Over the next month or so, 200 of the 300 members left the Portland church. This is very interesting because this is stating that people left because Kip came. Well, let's see if that's true later in Kip's writings. I wanted to just point out uh, the Henry Crete letter here. Uh, it's referenced uh, from this letter here by these uh, three disciples. And uh, it's kind of what helps start uh, this kind of chaos moment for a lot of the churches. And so it was the prime opportunity for Kip to really take control of another church, even though he stepped down due to sins that were frankly, just not actually uh, taken care of. Uh, but that's the links there for you to read. It's very interesting read, uh, very insightful uh, on many things. Here is uh, one of the first Portland International Church of Christ bulletins. It was published on September 7th, 2003, and it was called Times of Refreshing Will Come. And I just want to read this to you here about uh, what Kip actually confesses here in regards to him taking ownership of the Portland Church. It says here that uh, the lead evangelist and his wife left the ministry in April, and Bible talk and discipleship partners were abandoned. Key members of the legal board were asked to resign, and relationships with the San Francisco Church of Christ was questioned with bitterness. And the half of the listed membership of 237 either left to worship separately or to stop attending the church altogether. The formal split occurred in June. Elaine and I became the evangelist woman's ministry leader in mid-July. During this past month, to help unify all the injured brothers and sisters, we have initiated conversations with most of all the leaders of the separate group, as well as all the current members by House Church of the Portland Church. This was very sad, but revealing period. It became clear to us that if there was any hope of reconciliation of the departed members, the present leadership needed to confess where they sinned during the past few years, as well as during the tumultuous past few weeks. The Portland leaders confessed insensitivity, arrogance, lack of love, and cowardice. It was also very obvious that many of the members had reacted to the sins of their leaders with signs of anger, bitterness, factions, and slander. I personally was moved by the confessions as well, as they were all very sincere and many were done with tears. I will never forget that momentous evening. So here we got Kip uh, basically explaining that right before he came, people stopped coming to the Portland Church of Christ. Well, what was documented earlier was they stopped coming because of Kip coming, <laughs> and they didn't want Kip as their leader. If you fast forward to October of 2005, uh, there was a brother's letter to Kip McKean, and it was really on an appeal for repentance, as now that he's leading the Portland Church of Christ, uh, they just continue to see uh, many sins in his life. And of course, they they really reach out to him with a lot of grace and humility. They talk about his pride and arrogance and anger, his disrespect, gossip, slander, and condemnation towards churches and disciples, uh, his ungodly ethics, hatred, discord, jealousy, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. All these things they start calling out. And of course, uh, they talk about what's going to happen if you have a godly sorrow versus a worldly sorrow. Uh, here's what you need to do. You need to... Um, apologize and stop your pride, your selfish ambition, your judging, your blaming, your causing divisions, recruiting people to move to Portland, dividing people from their church families, blaming others, and immoral ethics of sinning deliberately. So these were things that he was being asked to stop. Um, of course, this is how he was going to turn things around, but if he was having a worldly sorrow, these are the things that they said he was probably going to do. And of course, their motivation was the concern for his soul, his family, the churches, the weak, uh, and the future. And of course, they talked about, hey, we're willing to forgive. Um, and all these evangelists signed this letter uh, asking Kip to repent. 
Later, in November of 2005, they then make a brother's statement. Uh, this, again, was uh, a follow-up to the previous letter. And uh, they talk about pride and arrogance and anger. And uh, again, they go into what would it mean to repent? What would it mean if you were to, um, to have a worldly sorrow versus a godly sorrow? And of course, all these brothers uh, then sign this letter. Well, if you fast forward to... Uh, 2006, you'll find a heartfelt apology. It was um, documented in, in June. Um, I believe the date was June 11th here. And uh, he gives this heartfelt apology uh, to the churches. And he goes in to say kind of how he came to this heartfelt apology. And it was really that previous May when he invited Doug Arthur and some other brothers and sisters uh, to be with him, and Doug Arthur led him in a Bible study. So I just want to read this part of this article called A Heartfelt Apology. This is written by Kip and given to the churches. It says, Doug Arthur led us in a Bible study in Philippians 1 about Paul's perspective during personal trying times. He continued with James 3 about the tongue, Ephesians 4, admonishing me to not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up our brothers according to their needs. Then he laid out his concerns. Number one, the Portland Bulletin routinely puts down church leadership and disciples who were trying to please God with all their hearts. Specifically, he cited volume four, number four, I was lost and now I am found by Jermaine Simmons. Doug confronted us that though the Philadelphia church was not named by implication, it was spitting in the face of the Philadelphia leadership that had tried very hard in the past to help Jermaine. Also cited was volume four, ver number 18, group or individual discipling. Yes, written by me. Uh, he reiterated that he agreed doctrinally with all that was written, yet the impression given by the article was that Portland was the only one truly doing it. This again was spitting in the face of the church leaderships and the, that were trying to follow the Bible's commands of discipling. He asked me to repent of arrogance and to be encouraging the bulletin. When Doug said these words, my heart was pierced. I asked how I could repent. He suggested I write an article apologizing for my sins. Then in the future, run the bulletin article by other brothers before publishing them. Doug Arthur and Doug Lambert were encouraged at each staff meeting. That week's article is reviewed and critiqued by almost 20 people. Doug Arthur then suggested it needed to be critiqued by people outside the Portland congregation. I responded by saying we would be greatly honored if Doug would do it. He readily agreed. Number two, we then asked if there was anything else the brothers wanted to share. They felt that though the years I did not have respectful attitude toward the mainline brothers, granted their churches faced challenges of many kinds, yet there were true brothers in each congregation. He said, you treated them like a stray dog that you kicked every time you pass by. Third, lastly, they said that where groups of disciples have come out of ICOC congregations and Portland has either supported these groups of disciples or gathered them to initiate a new congregation, make it clear that you still believe the other churches have many disciples and you desire to have a warm relationship with them. Doug mentioned Chicago, Kiev, and Phoenix. Doug also expressed that since we no longer always have one congregation in one city and we must allow people to follow their convictions as they work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12, realizing that we now have to work harder than ever to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We must let no unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. He also clarified that he was not asking Portland to back down on our dream to see the world evangelized in the 21st century. I am so sorry to everyone who is striving to be a dedicated disciple of Jesus. Please forgive my arrogance and disrespect in the Portland Bulletin articles and in my Sunday sermons, which are online. I do believe there are church leaderships and around the world that are trying very hard to restore the lordship of Christ and discipling, particularly encouraging our re recent reports I've heard from around the globe about the great progress being made in Florida, Maryland, Texas, Virginia, Mexico, Central America, Africa, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. I am sure that there is even more good news, but these are just a few that have come to my attention recently. I am deeply sorrowful to all my brothers and sisters in the mainline Church of Christ who are striving to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Please forgive my lack of respect and recognition to your efforts for Christ. Though we are supportive of new congregations of dedicated disciples, let me extend a heartfelt apology to the churches in Chicago, Phoenix, and Kiev for giving the impression of a blanket condemnation that there were no disciples in them or that their congregations were spiritually dead. Please forgive me. 
I know that there are many sold out disciples in these congregations. I am also aware that every church faces trials of many kinds, including Portland and these new congregations, these new congregations, the Portland leadership, and I would like to apologize for things that we have said or done that hurt you or discouraged you in your faith. Going forward, we strive to avoid these mistakes and would like to work together as closely as possible to evangelize each city in the entire world. After about six hour session with the elders, Steve, Doug, Arthur, and Doug Lambert, Doug, Arthur, and I spent two hours late into the night sharing our dreams and church building thoughts. Again, this was back in June of 2006. But then we come to Partners in the Gospel. Now, Partners in the Gospel, there's one, two, and three, and these were, <laughs> were written just at the tail end of, of his time in Portland. And you start to see that there's some statements here um, that are very, very interesting. I would like to scroll down here to uh, one spot here. Uh, just to kind of show the convictions Kip had at this time. He says, for these reasons, after several agonizing days of prayer, as well as counsel from the Portland elders and evangelists, my decision at this juncture is to start over with whoever is willing to help in building a worldwide movement for baptizing lost souls, learning from the past. We want to make it very clear that we are not condemning those who do not consider themselves part of this movement. Anyone who is a baptized disciple making every effort to walk in the light as a brother is a brother in Christ and promised heaven. Participating in this new movement is not an issue of salvation. This is an issue of building a unified effort to preach Christ in every nation. Being a part of this new movement is an issue of being able to go from one city to the next and find a fellowship of disciples who speak the same language and are kindred spirits. Okay. I think a lot of us could, could get behind that. Well, the second part of Partners in the Gospel, I'd like to scroll down and read a little excerpt here. He says again, let me reiterate from the first Partners in the Gospel that I believe there are sold out disciples in the mainline Church of Christ and many thousands in the ICOC churches. Just as much, I believe any person in any church anywhere who becomes a disciple of Jesus and is baptized for remission of sins becomes a saved brother or sister in the kingdom of God. Yet, the distinctiveness of this new movement among the Portland family churches is as simple as this. We are in agreement to call each member to be a sold out for Christ and to cooperate with each other in our dream to evangelize the world in this generation. Again, very interesting verbiage at the beginning. Another one that's also from Portland is Partners in the Gospel, Part 3. And again, I'd like to scroll down just to share with you um, some principles that we're seeing at the very beginning. But here's one that's very interesting. He says, therefore, principles that are condemned in November 2002, such as delegating authority from world sector leaders to lead evangelists, to regional evangelists, to sector leaders, to Bible talk leaders, are validated by such Old Testament passages as Exodus 18, 13 through 26. Jethro says the Mos Moses that God so commands, the delegating of authority so as to not wear out the leaders as well as to meet all the needs of large numbers of God's people. Also, the concept of calling out a remnant is clearly seen over and over again in the Old Testament. I am like anyone else in that I have my own opinions about what happened to our fellowship. Years of unresolved, bitter feelings, insular leadership, that means... Um, uh, separated that that's um uh basically like um you're you're on an island of leadership you're independent <laughs> he says uh in infantizing people coupled with a lack of emphasis on god's grace eventually dried out our fellowship then one match in february 2003 the crete letter was all that it took to ignite a fire that refined almost everything since god is sovereign my conviction is that either god set the fire or allowed it to be set. So um, very interesting uh, to use the Exodus 18 as a passage, why we should have a central leader with world sector leaders, uh, puts himself in the seat of Moses, which I've talked about in another uh, sermon. But what's interesting here is his conviction that everything was dismantled by God. Okay. Lastly, I wanna show you the first article 
uh, by Kip when he planted the City of Angels International Christian Church. And it's an article entitled Welcome Home. So this would have been May of 2007. And in this uh, passage, we find a, a very, very interesting uh, conviction that Kip has. And it's him describing the history, which we just went through. Look at what he writes here. From 1990 to 2001, God blessed Elena and me to oversee the building of the LA ICOC to 10,000 disciples. While on our sabbatical in 2002, the LA ICOC leadership was at the forefront of calling all ICOC leaders to a more mainline theology. Then in April 2003, the LA leadership asked us to leave the ministry since we no longer share the same vision and convictions. After publicly apologizing for our sins and shortcomings in the open letter, Revolution Through Restoration 3, God sent us to Portland, Oregon to be healed and rekindle our faith. There God remained reminded us that we did uh, that uh, us what we did right for all the years of the Boston movement, as well as teaching us where we had sinned and made mistakes. Though devastated in 2003, like most ICOC congregations, the Portland International Church of Christ grew from our first midweek of 25 disciples to over 500 on Sundays in just three years. This last year, God blessed us with 104 baptisms. Never a day passed that I did not feel a deep responsibility as the father of faith in all the ICOC churches. Therefore, once the Portland church became an example, in love, I challenged the lukewarmness in most churches. Yet this was labeled as unwholesome talk. Then, when small groups of disciples in several congregations came to a conviction that they could not change the lukewarmness and lack of discipling from the inside— they came out and started new churches that desired Portland's discipling and shared our core dreams and convictions. At this point, I was labeled divisive. God, through this pouring out of new wine into old wineskins, created a new movement with new churches in Chicago, Phoenix, Honolulu, San Francisco, Las Vegas, Manila, Philippines, Toronto, Canada, Mumbai, India, Kiev, Ukraine, London, England, and San Pedro, Sosa, Sola. Uh, Honduras, Brisbane, Australia, and of course, Los Angeles, just to name a few. During our time in rainy Portland, though they were highly criticized, more and more people moved here from all over the United States to find spiritual revival. Among them were DJ and Casey Commisford, who gave up everything and moved from Ohio. They wrote the following song telling their story. So everything we just read contradicts what Kip writes here and why he left, why he apologized in 2006, he, he twists the history. And again, we find that Kip really believes history will be kind to him because he plans to write it. I give you these links so that you can study it yourself. There's so much more you can read, but hopefully this gives you some knowledge. And with that knowledge, hopefully you can make good decisions and have wisdom. Thank you.